Good morning, everybody. Um, if you would, if you've got space and you can move in a bit, that might be very nice for those who are coming in. Come on in. Uh, the end of the world was, is a very, very popular theme in late modern uh, stories. In the 20th century, atomic war was the greatest concern, and so apocalyptic stories boomed. That was a good pun. You missed it. Anyway, um, uh, atomic war later, those kind of stories morphed into fears about more mundane catastrophes like, like global warming, like genetically modified grains, like uh, viral lab leaks. Who knew that Gary Larson was a prophet? Um, And then with the advent of artificial intelligence, the world-ending fever pitch just keeps increasing, right? Let me show you a really funny example. Um, Somebody posted this on on their page. It's uh, it's one of those CAPTCHA things, and it says, select all squares that match the label Sarah Connor. If none, click skip. And some brilliant guy underneath had written, ha ha, good try, AI. I'm not going to help you recognize the mother of the rebel resistance. (laughs) Terminator jokes aside, people get really upset thinking the world has already collapsed. I I really believe that REM's singing the end of the world as we know it is a pretty fair summary of modern fears. But these fears, listen, these fears are actually not modern at all. We are nowhere near the first people to think that history must be ending with us. The Thessalonian church got there first. Open your Bible to 2 Thessalonians, which amazingly comes right after 1 Thessalonians in your New Testament. Go there and let's see how Paul corrects them and and us. Let's read verses 1 through 3. Now, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to be easily upset or troubled, either by a prophecy or by a message, or by a letter supposedly from us alleging that the day of the Lord has come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. For that day will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. In our notes, take a look in your notes, either through the link online, we are so delighted to be with you, or here in the auditorium, open up your bulletin. You'll see I headline this section, Don't Be Dismayed by Commentators. False Prophets can and do make predictions all the time. Politicians will cry wolf all day long trying to get your votes or your money, but it doesn't matter, Christian. You cannot, you must not become dismayed by all these voices. Even if all looks lost, even if the world looks like it's not just heading to hell in a handbasket, but is already there and the basket is on fire, you must trust God and keep your cool. Why? Look at your text. It reminds us of three very important things. The rapture hasn't come, the day of the Lord hasn't arrived, and scripture alone is clear and trustworthy. Let's go through these three excellent points. First, the rapture hasn't arrived. Verse one refers to the rapture, that is the removal of Christians from the earth. It's something Paul discussed back in the first Thessalonian letter. And verse three, look there, it almost surely has the same thing in mind. Apostasia in verse three. This is a word that gets a really bum rap in English. Um, The word range of meaning is much wider than apostasy in the way we use that term. We say apostasy for people who are falling away from the truth or who who fall away into sin. And that, that is one meaning of apostasia. But it can also mean being removed, being caught up in a positive sense. And the context here strongly indicates that connotation. Now, we're not told when this rapture will come, but we're told it will come before the day of the Lord. Keep your finger in 2 Thessalonians and turn back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, okay? Go back to 1 Thess 4. Look at what God says through Paul and Silas and Timothy in the first letter. Go to verse uh, 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are still alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. There are seven parts to this revelation. Um, Number one, first thing we read, the Lord appears in the visible atmosphere. Look at how Paul goes out of his way to stress that all this takes place in the air, in the clouds. Do, Do you see that? 
The reason is there's a whole separate set of prophecies that concerns when Jesus actually sets foot on the earth and establishes his kingdom. That's called the second coming of Christ in, in popular parlance. The, the, he wants to make sure, Paul wants to make sure this church and all churches doesn't confuse this appearance of Jesus to resurrect his church with the later second coming of Jesus on earth. Next thing, the Lord commands. Kalisma, a shout in verse 16, is an order. Now, this is an order that, that is very firmly given. This is the lion of the tribe of Judah giving his war cry. But Kalisma means something that sets in place a very precise series of events that are executed with perfect timing. Best illustration I can think of is, is a team of eights rowing in perfect synchronization in response to the shout of stroke, stroke, all right? That's Kalisma. Then, third thing, the archangel repeats the command. Michael the archangel repeats back Jesus' command. Um, the, the, you would, the phone is the Greek word used. It was used in military situations when the general said attack, and then phone, the colonel, would repeat attack, and the troops would go. Number four, the trumpet signals. There was a great feast in Israel. You can read about it in Leviticus called the, the Festival of Trumpets, the Feast of Trumpets. And there was a last trumpet in that feast that is just like this last trump here. In each situation, that trumpet has one purpose. This last trump in this festival has one purpose, to show the world that God has atoned for those people that he graciously claims as his. He has atoned for them, and they will tabernacle. They will live with him. All God's people said? Amen. Beautiful. Number five, dead Christians resurrect. Verse 16 says, dead in Christ will rise first. Their souls will be coupled with new, sinless, permanent bodies. Number six, all living Christians get snatched and are changed. Um, in verse 17, a jaw-cracking word appears that, that means something snatched by force. By the way, when they were putting the Bible into the section of English we call Middle English, um, at the time period just before and partially including William Shakespeare that era, um, they were using a Latin word for this and they translated this jaw-cracking term with raptura. And so in Middle English, it came to be called the rapture and it's stuck with it ever since. So that's why when you hear people talk about the rapture, that's why it's called that. Uh, Christians are changed in the twinkling of an eye. They're turned into sinless souls with resurrected bodies. Look at all these things God promises us will occur. The Lord appears, he signals, the archangel passes on the command, the trump sounds, dead Christians get changed. We are snatched and changed. And verse seven, we are with Jesus forever. How is that for a bit of news? Amen? Yeah. Oh, and by the way, all of this only applies to church age Christians. Those Jews and Gentiles who trust the Messiah during the church age. So, go back now to 2 Thessalonians. Back in 2 Thess, Paul is writing to people who've been taught that. They've been taught this prophetic truth of the rapture. And apparently they're upset because they're facing some pretty serious persecution and this rapture hasn't occurred yet. Now, this is an illogical and yet very, very normal response. Apocalyptic seeming events spark the same fears in every age. They always do. Everywhere I look throughout history, from, from Second Thessalonians to the Black Plague to U.S. shootings, the question's always the same. In our human centeredness, we fear that we have somehow missed God's plan, right? That we have missed or messed up or misunderstood the rapture. <gasps> Something must be wrong. I remember um, looking at you, Skylar, makes me think of this especially. I, I remember when Saddam Hussein started launching Scud missiles at, at Jerusalem. No provocation, no reason to, no declared war, just starts throwing these horrible missiles into Israel. Um, John Walvard, who was the, <clears throat> uh, not at that time he was president, I think he was the, uh, the chancellor of Dallas Seminary. He was a very famous scholar who'd actually written a number of books on the rapture. John Walvard, while these scud missiles are going into Jerusalem, came walking into a faculty meeting at Dallas Seminary. All the faculty were gathered around watching the missiles on TV. And Walvard walked in and he said, I sure hope we're right about this whole rapture before the terrible day of the Lord thing. <laughs> now he was joking, he was totally joking, but you get, you get the feeling, right? The rapture hasn't come, there's bad news, all these commentators are making us nervous, but we needn't fear because the day of the Lord hasn't come either. You know, often people who go through very hard times assume that their evil days must be this promised day of the Lord. They aren't. 
I just grabbed one scripture out of hundreds. Zephaniah chapter one. Near is the great day of the Lord. Near and coming very quickly. Listen, the day of the Lord. In it, the warrior cries out bitterly. A day of wrath is that day, a day of trouble and distress, a day of destruction and desolation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Clouds and thick darkness. The Bible describes this day of the Lord that is coming as imminent, meaning it could occur any time now. It is part of a series of events that haven't happened yet, but they will occur in God's timing. And that day of the Lord includes intense judgment upon all people on the earth. It will bring unprecedented terror, warfare, distress, and death. That's why even battle-hardened warriors cry during it. It's imminent. It's terrible. But it hasn't come yet. So quit believing the lunatic fringe of this world. Stop looking for answers in ecstatic visions or popular novels. Quit being dismayed by false commentators. Every time there is a tsunami or riots or wretched injustice, I receive letters about these very serious issues. And in those letters, the authors usually say, is this the end of the world? And it's a totally understandable question. But every time I write them back and tell them, look, the end of the age is not mysterious. The Bible is very clear on this subject, and as horrible as today's tragedy may be, and sometimes it is, none of this comes close to what the day of the Lord will be like. I really do think the rock group Bachman Turner Overdrive was actually quoting scripture when they sang, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> but baby, you just ain't seen nothing yet, right? Third big idea. The scripture alone is clear and trustworthy. Only scripture, certified apostolic instruction kept in writing is valid. There are lots of voices in this world, but they are all more or less off kilter. The world give, here's what the world's like. The world gives you signs like this. These are real signs. Uh, and I quote, psychic fair canceled due to unforeseen circumstances. <laughs> It really tells you all you need to know. Actually, you should have known something was wrong when the restaurant's called the Little Death. I mean, who wants to eat there? Um, or you get mixed messages like this Outback restaurant, which says fish of the day, beef. All right? That's a good one. Or this bit of brilliant civic planning, emergency phone not installed. Please do not have an emergency at this location. All right? Here's, here's one more. This one just absolutely blows my mind. Illiterate, write for free help. I think that's just cruel. Um, is that where you want to get your leads in a world that produces that kind of nonsense? Please say no, please say no, say no. No, no thank you. Of course not. Instead, we want to turn to, we must turn to God's word alone. Because of scripture, we will not be dismayed. And scripture gives us the real story of this day of great tribulation. Read the next section. Go to verse three. Verse three. <clears throat> Don't let anyone deceive you. Uh, and it goes down and says, the man of lawlessness, let's pick it up there, is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he sits in God's temple proclaiming that he himself is God. Don't you remember when I was still with you, I used to tell you about this? And you know what currently restrains him so that he will be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, but the one restraining will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed. The Lord Jesus will destroy him with the breath of his mouth and will bring him to nothing at the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is based on Satan's working with all kinds of false miracle signs and wonders and with every wicked deception among those who are perishing. They perish because they did not accept the love of the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a strong delusion so that they will believe the lie, so that all will be condemned, those who did not believe the truth but delighted in unrighteousness. The day of the Lord contains a seven-year period of tribulation. It's described by Daniel and a bunch of the other prophets. And the latter half of that era is what's being referenced here. And it's absolutely horrible. Let me just give you a big picture view of, of what Paul's talking about here. There, there is a period of time that leads up to the cross. And there are lots and lots of signs to Israel and lots of signs in Christ's advent. You can read the Gospel of John, it's full of them. And then after Christ's ascension, we have the age you and I live in now, the church age 
where there's no wall between Jew and Gentile. All who trust Messiah Jesus are one in Christ. And then comes the rapture. The rapture is intriguing because as we just read, it's signless. There's no premonition of when. It's an imminent thing could happen at any moment. At some point after that, and this is a little flawed because we don't know how big the gap is here. It may be extensive, but there is then a 70th week. Now, it's not, don't be dismayed by that. Daniel uses a prophetic type terminology and everybody just uses Daniel's terms. A week is a seven year period. And Daniel prophesies about a 70th week, this, this horrible seven years of tribulation. The last half of that is particularly grotesque. It's often called the great tribulation, okay? That's the context of what he's talking about here. A couple things we need to note about this time period. First thing, and this may sound very simplistic to you, but it's important that I say it. None of this is brought about by humans. The reason that's so significant to state is because there are people who walk around with this idea in their heads that we need to set things in motion, that God needs our help. One popular strain of this falsity goes like this. Um, God's sovereignty is limited by human inaction. The, The thinking is, if I don't do the right things that I'm supposed to do to fulfill God's plan, then his plan won't happen. It can't happen because I dropped the ball. That is folly. It is amazing hubris and it's scary. But I think even more dangerous, equally foolish but more dangerous, are people who think that they can take certain actions that will actually change the world. Um, Richard Landis of Boston University has made a a career out of studying these kinds of people. And by the way, he talks about they come from all stripes. There are Christians, there are Marxists, Islamists, Nazis, environmentalists, homosexuals, transgender, all across the board. They all think it's up to them to force change. Look what he says about them in, in his book, Heaven on Earth. Like many active cataclysmic apocalypticists, they believe that the sociopolitical world is in huge tension, like tectonic plates about to crack. And if they can set off a small explosion in the right place, it will unleash far greater forces, close quote. That's what they think, but that's a lie. That is a lie. The great tribulation is not brought about by humans. It can't be because of God's restrainer. It's not until the tribulation that the restrainer is removed. By the way, that's the headline on the right side of our notes. Look there, the restrainer is removed. Verses six and seven describe a controller who keeps everything in place until God is ready. When the time comes for this man of lawlessness to be revealed, God will remove the restrainer. By the way, the verbal will be revealed in verse six as apocalypto. What modern English word does that sound like? Apocalypto, what does it sound like? Apocalyptic, that's right. But, but you know, <laughs> it's so sad because in the immortal words of Inigo Montoya, I do not think that word means what you think it means. <laughs> when we say apocalyptic today, we mean something earth-shattering, right? But the Greeks knew better. Apocalypto just means the revelation. It just means showing what is true, the revelation of God's plan. And in God's plan, there is this person of great evil, the Antichrist, who will become clear and powerful when the restrainer is removed. And that brings up the big question. Who is the restrainer? What is the restrainer? Man, people love to discuss this. And let me tell you, that you ready for the right answer? I don't know. I don't know. And no one else does either. Okay, I have read very passionate arguments, very well-reasoned arguments, but there's no way to biblically prove that, that, that you are the restrainer. The church of Jesus Christ is the restrainer. That's certainly possible. Uh, others claim it must be the Holy Spirit or angels. Some say that it's human government. You can make arguments for any of these. I'll tell you my favorite one. My favorite one was a seminary paper that I was blessed to grade for a professor friend, and it was actually a brilliant paper because it's a very serious point, but it, the serious point was hidden underneath a beautiful veneer. You'll know what the humor is when you see the title. The paper was titled, Why Duct Tape is the Restrainer of 2 Thessalonians 2. I knew he would get an A when I saw the title. Um, God doesn't tell us who the restrainer is, and frankly, we don't need to know. What we do need to know and find comfort is is that until the restrainer is removed, the Antichrist can do nothing. Once the restrainer is removed, Antichrist declares himself God. Verse 4 uncovers this incredibly creepy event. Now, we don't know when this temple gets rebuilt. It may be the Antichrist himself has it built. But I'll tell you this, with my own eyes, I have seen in Jerusalem the materials already made and waiting for use in a new temple of God whenever it gets constructed. They're beautiful, covered in gold, very expensive. 
And I will tell you, it is very sobering to look at those things and know that they will be defiled someday by somebody claiming to be God himself. By the way, all of this is going to be part of a massive anti-Semitic campaign. And I'm not exaggerating here in the least. That makes the Holocaust look tame. We're not going to go into that today, but we will talk about that this summer when we study the book of Revelation. Now, I, I know what you're thinking. In, in your, in your uh, Terminator imitation, you're, you're asking yourself in your robotic Terminator voice, how does the Antichrist put this off? How does he get people to follow him as God? Arnold. Great question, Arnold. Thank you for asking. The Antichrist and the false prophet deceive with signs. Look, look. Miracle signs, wonders, those are key words. They let us know that this Antichrist, this person of destruction and lawlessness, is trying very hard to impersonate Jesus. Revelation 13 describes one uh, called the false prophet, who's also going to be part of this charade. Now, notice that I said impersonate, not imitate. Christians are told that by God's grace, we can partner with the Spirit such that we grow up in Christ's likeness. That is not the case with this demonically inspired Antichrist. This is not a humble imitation. This is a robotic impersonation like my Terminator voice, right? By the way, this impersonation of God's power is one of the main reasons I am never moved by anyone who claims that they can do something miraculous. It's why the signs and wonders movement in Christianity gives me great pause. The Bible tells us Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Did you know this? Did you know that scripture records almost as many miracles performed by demonic power as it does ones performed by God's power? Did you know that? It's not that there's some evil equal yin and yang. God is sovereign. It's just telling you that miracles tell you nothing. The irrefutable word of the Lord is to be our guide, not some show. Miracles are very nice, but they don't tell us anything unless they are a specific part of God's revealed prophecy and plan. Please don't misunderstand. Don't go throwing rocks. I am not saying that some faith healer down in Dallas is necessarily demonic. I am saying that only God's revealed, recorded word is trustworthy for guidance. Let's read the first part of verse 3 again. Let's all read it together. The first part of verse 3, 2 Thess 2, verse 3. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. Amen? All right, now back to our wild story of the true events in the Great Tribulation. Next thing that happens is people claim a secret second coming of Christ. Now, this was not enumerated in our text that we just read, but it is alluded to. So let me read you the scripture um, that Paul's referring to. This is from Matthew chapter 24. Uh, it's part of a, 24 and 25 is a really cool section called the Olivet Discourse. That was free. Now you're educated, okay? All right. While he, Jesus, was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples approached him privately. There's no crowd, just them. And said, tell us, when will these things happen? And what is the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Jesus replied to them. He gave a lot of wonderful replies, but here's how he begins. Watch out that no one deceive you. For many will come in my name saying, I'm the Messiah, and they will deceive many. Again, this specifically discusses days to come in which you and I will not participate if we're believers in Jesus because we'll be gone by then. But the principle still applies to us. Listen, this still applies to you. Have any idea how much energy is expended annually on false sightings of Jesus? Look up here. I want you to look at this. This is a burned fish stick that supposedly has a special message for the world. This guy who burned his supper, I'm sorry, to whom God made a miraculous appearance, um, he, he posted this picture, and I watched the interviews as reporters were asking him. He said, this is a sign from God. And my favorite question once said, well, what does it mean? He said, I don't know. I just know it's a sign from God. <laughs> Look at this one. This is a, a dental x-ray from a lady in Arizona. Now, the lady and her dentist are both believers in Jesus, which is great. They're our brethren, all right? But they released a joint statement in which they said, and I quote, this x-ray is a sure sign that God is soon implementing his end-time strategy. <laughs> what? That's what Mueller Messiah means? I don't, what, what is going on here? Folks, please think this through. How do we even know what Jesus looks like? We have no idea. These apparitions could be Fidel Castro for all we know. It's more likely. That looks like Fidel to me, and we know what he looks like. There is no image of Jesus older than the 4th century A.D. 
fourth century, 300 years after he lived. We have no idea what Jesus looked like. What does Jesus himself say of these so-called revelations? He promises he will return, but neither his rapture appearing in the clouds nor his second coming when Jesus steps foot back on that Mount of Olives, neither one has anything to do with a fish stick. The final aspect, amen, the final aspect of the great tribulation that's uncovered here in 2 Thessalonians is found in verses 10 through 12. Look there. This is where God judges truth rejectors. There's a fascinating argument formed here. It appears elsewhere in Scripture. It's, it's a both-and argument. The Lord is trying to help us see things both from our human point of view and from God's omniscient uh, causal point of view. Look, look at verse 11. Look, God is totally and utterly sovereign, right? That means he chooses he sends deceptive spirits that cloud those who are not his elect. You got it? God chooses to blind some people. However, the text in verse 11 begins with a, a, a Greek uh, introduction, kahidea. Kahidea is, is a construction that means um, a causative statement of reason. So do you see what God's saying? These humans choose. They perish because of their own choice, which is detailed up in verse 10. So you put it together and you realize this is a both and. It's exactly the same thing you see with Esau in the Old Testament or, or Pharaoh or, or Saul. It's both God's choice and their choice. As Dr. Robertson summarized it best 100 years ago, he said, this is a definitive judicial act of God who destines the wicked over to the evil which they have deliberately chosen themselves. Close quote. When, jo when God judges truth rejectors, whether it's in the Old Testament or in the tribulation to come or today, it is always a remarkable study of how God is totally sovereign and humans are fully responsible. It's both. The Thessalonians are wrongly worried that they have somehow lost their salvation or they have missed something important. So you know what God does next? He reveals the real story of Christians in the church age. Read verses 13 and 14. This is awesome. But we ought to thank God always for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, because from the beginning, God has chosen you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and through belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel so that you might obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the real story for the church age Christian. You are lovingly chosen. Do you look at that? Beloved of God, God chose you from the beginning. He called you. This is ponderously, deeply beautiful. And it is so opposite of our experiences in this broken world that most of us really struggle to grasp this truth. We understand rejection. We, we've had people break up with us. We, we've gotten summons to come to court when we're being sued. We, we've seen our children mistreated by other people, right? We, we get rejection. That we understand. But what this is telling me is that all of that rejection is just a skin-deep lie. In reality, longer and deeper than human beings can fathom time and space, you and I have been the ones Jesus loves. This is amazing. Look, look at this. Look, look up here. The Holy Spirit inspired a really old word to heighten the meaning here. Uh, hey, eleto, the word we translate chosen, was a real, get this, it was a really old-fashioned term already at the time this was written. Eleto means to lift up, to choose, and move towards the sun. Now, I've looked and looked, and I cannot find any record of this word being used anywhere in the Bible, outside the Bible, for over 200 years before this was written. It's an old-fashioned word. It's like, it's like somebody grabbing some word from, from Middle English and, and just, wherefore too so art thou, and just applying it in a 21st century letter. You only do that for a specific reason, right? And the reason here is clear. Use an old-fashioned word to show that God chose you a long, long, long time ago. He selected you to be lifted up to the sun. All God's people said? This is God's boundless love toward everyone who will trust him. God, God has had photos of you on his wall since before you were. God's had photos of you on his wall since before there were photos or walls, right? This is awesome. Can I get a hallelujah for that? Hallelujah. Amen. God wants us to know about the here and now as well as the future. And the real story of our time is that you who know Christ are his beloved. You're also granted salvation, justified, sanctified, and glorified. This is really cool. Um, you see, when you're reading the Bible and you see the word salvation or saved, um, you've got to look at the context because that word has three different thought components to it, especially in Greek writing. 
Um, Let's go through them because they all three appear in this text. Justification is always by faith. Now, to be justified, justification is to be made right with God. That can only happen through trust in God's provision. The principle can be found way back at the very beginning. Here, read with me. Genesis 15, 6. Let's read it all together. Abram believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. All right? Abram was made right with God by faith. By the way, the Bible then shows that this is the method for all. It is God's grace through faith that makes people right. God has chosen you for justification and salvation by belief. Sanctification is the process of becoming holy. Now, the Bible discusses this in great detail. Sanctification also occurs through God's grace. But unlike justification, sanctification also involves our effort as directed by the Holy Spirit who wears off our rough edges. It can be a painful process. I was dialoguing about this with Lason Ward uh, of our pulpit team, and she sent me this great reminder. Lason wrote me this week and said, Wayne, sanctification reminds me of the Velveteen Rabbit story. How many of you have read The Velveteen Rabbit? Okay, over half. The rest of you, it takes, how long will it take? Five minutes? Is it a a three-minute read? And and you really, you really should. It's one of the great books. It really is. Uh, Right up there, Shakespeare, Velveteen Rabbit. It's really good. All right. Um, in, if you don't know the story, the, the stuffed animal in, in the Velveteen Rabbit, the little rabbit, he only can become real through, through lots of hard wear and tear. And as he's realizing this, here's what the rabbit says. Layson quoted this. The rabbit sighed. He thought it would be a long time before this magic called real happened to him. He longed to become real, to know what it felt like, and yet the idea of growing shabby and Losing his eyes and whiskers was rather sad. He, he wished that he could become it without these uncomfortable things happening to him. Close quote. We understand, don't we? Don't we all understand? But listen, until Jesus appears, sanctification requires daily cross-carrying. It requires losing your whiskers and your fur and your eyes. Finally, glorification is creature perfection. It's, it's becoming real where the sanctification process is completed by our change into glorified, sinless bodies and souls. First Thessalonians talked about this. Okay, do you see it? Justified, sanctified, glorified. Those are the three parts that make up the idea of salvation in the Bible. You always have to check the context because sometimes the specific terms aren't used. Now, in this situation, our author used all three together just to give us this tidy idea. This is our past, our present, our future encapsulated in two verses. So, Stand firm. Verse 15, let's finish the text. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold to the traditions you were taught, whether by what we said or what we wrote. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal encouragement and good hope by grace, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good work and word. Hold to the apostolic truth. Do not lose your way in the weird practices of this world that have no grounding in Scripture. Now, I need to say a quick word here. Catholic and Greek Orthodox priests, Russian Orthodox priests as well, they will sometimes argue that this verse means that people, Christians, should only worship and live. They will say this, you should only live exactly the way people did in the 4th century. Now, they always say the 4th century, not the 1st. And the reason is, in the 4th century is when their churches became codified, which is fine. You do realize every writing we have about churches in the first three centuries always calls them churches. There's no church. There's no organized church. It's the churches. Paul says, to the churches, to the churches. In the 4th century, suddenly it became the church. So they'll say, you need to live that way when it was all codified and put together. Um, an old friend of mine, a man that I really love and respect, hi, Mark, I know you study with us. Um, Mark is a Greek Orthodox deacon. He's also a very talented surgeon. And Mark wrote me once, and he said, Wayne, doesn't Second Thessalonians 2.15 make you want to get rid of your auditorium screens and put up icons instead? <laughs> it's a fine question. And this is what I wrote back. I said, Mark, if it meant that, you'd have to get rid of your modern medical texts and instruments and use only what Dr. Luke had available to him. I doubt that God or your patients desires that. All right? God isn't telling us in verse 15 to remain stuck in the practices of any particular time period. 
He is saying we must base our creative new lives on that which is recorded in Scripture alone. And only Scripture captures the first century practices of the apostles, not later church dogmatics. They may be useful, but they're not our guide. Friends, the Bible is ever new. Every generation applies the unchangeable truths of God's word to the ever-changing world around them. So let's hold on to this apostolic truth and live it out in ever new ways. Amen? Looking at the apostles' final point, accept God's comfort so you keep on. Uh, Word and work in verse 17. That means your election includes and begets responsibility. Tell me this. Does the text say, may God comfort you as you sit on your fanny and do nothing? Is that what it says? Yes or no? No, that is not what it says. It says for every good word and work. That means we stand strong. We accept the delight of God's strength and comfort in order to activate us to do and say the great things God has prepared for us to do. I know. Life sometimes appears very grim. I get it. But no matter how dark the night may appear, God has positioned us as lights to the world. I love all the smiles I'm getting over here from the Legend of Zelda players. Those of you who don't play video games, this picture explains why your employees have been so tired and unproductive the last couple of weeks. They've all been up till three in the morning playing the Legend of Zelda. This is the bad guy. We're to be like the good guy here. We, not somebody else, you and I, we have things to do right now. We must keep on keeping on. We have words that need to be said, words of encouragement and and edification. We have works that must be done. Even though this is not, and it is not, the great day of the Lord in the tribulation, we all have pains that seem sometimes like the end of the world as we know it, but we feel fine. We feel fine. We grieve, we ache, but we feel fine and we keep on keeping on because God is with us and he has a plan. Amen? Amen. That's the bottom line. That's our calling. That's what Paul prays about here. And we should pray about the same thing. Here, bow your heads. Let's pray together. Pray with me. Father, I pray that we will stop being fearful. May we stand strong Rejoice in your sovereignty, delight in our salvation, rest in your perfect plan. Father, may we trust you to achieve your ends. Jesus, we look forward to the, when that day, when the breath of your mouth, your word destroys evil forever. And in the meantime, Jesus, we accept our responsibility to say the words that need to be said. Words like, I'm sorry. Words like, I love you. Or that is wrong. Or God loves you. Holy Spirit, by your grace, we will do the works that need to be done. We will pray. We will serve in ministry. We will give money. We will open our hearts and homes. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.